You see it? Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for having me, Anu, and thank you to the committee for having me today. Um, as Anu said, I'm Russell Mahalik at Goldie Beacon College. We are a small college in Wilmington, Delaware. We're teaching and learning college. Um, today, we'll explore the ethical integration of AI in academic libraries, focusing on institutional resistance, privacy, and equity and in information literacy. Let's see. This presentation provides a comprehensive overview of the integration of information literacy for AI technologies in academic libraries and the strategies employed to uphold ethical practices and address stakeholder concerns. We'll start by navigating institutional resistance to AI, addressing common fears. Then we'll discuss the ethical considerations of AI in academic settings. Finally, we'll look at practical applications of AI in academic libraries. Institutions often have a range of stakeholders, each with their own perspectives and concerns when it comes to the integration of AI. By engaging in open and transparent dialogue, we can work to understand these perspectives and develop strategies to address them. Key steps in this collaborative process include identifying specific fears and reservations expressed by campus leaders, addressing concerns around bias and privacy, developing clear policies and guidelines to govern the ethical use of AI, providing comprehensive training and education to allay misconceptions, and continuously soliciting feedback and maintaining open lines of communication. By navigating these institutional concerns proactively, we can pave the way for a smoother adoption of AI technology that aligns with the values and priorities of the academic community. All right, so now it's time to pull out your phones and then we're gonna do a poll real quickly. And hopefully this will work. We've trusted it, make sure it's good. So if you can either copy and paste the bit.ly into your web browser, or if you have your phone now, you can use the QR code. But I want to know, how do you feel about the use of AI in higher education? A lot of middle of the, middle of the road, um, some positive, not too many negative. You see more positive coming up. It's great. One person's fear, fear more fearful. A couple people I see are more on the ha happy side. But a lot of kind of middle. It's interesting. Yeah, keep on coming in and still see the kind of the same couple of people still in more on the the negative side, but not too many. I think we've come a long way since a couple of years ago when ChatGPT came out where if I did in the same poll, I think it would be more on the the angry, little happy face than the happy, happy face. So turn this off now. Go back to the presentation. When I first introduced the idea of bringing AI literacy to my college, my Provost responded, AI is morally wrong. And it was kind of a disheartening thing, but over the last couple of years, we've worked really hard to make sure that AI is incorporated in the curriculum. And we're going to be talking about how we did that and some of the neat stories that we've experienced in the last couple of semesters. Generally, when I've met people who express a range of concerns about integrating AI in something that could be the curriculum, their daily lives, usually it is because one of these four of these four drivers. There's a lack of understanding. There's ethical considerations. We had one student in the class recently said she just won't use AI for any reason at all for ethics or for for her intellectual property reasons. We have resistance to change and job displacement concerns. Today, we're going to talk mostly about ethical considerations, but we must address these fears through education. And that's really my key thing is through information literacy, we can solve a lot of these different fears we have in education in higher education about AI. So integrating AI into the curriculum is a collaborative process. To gain the provost buy-in, we developed a collaborative approach across departments and with faculty. This collaborative process serves several key purposes. 
It helps build trust and buy-in from the faculty as they are directly involved in the shaping and the policies that will direct and will impact their teaching and students' work. It ensures consistency in the application of AI guidelines and the tools that we teach our students for equity reasons across the institution, fostering a unified approach. It aligns the use of AI with academic standards and values that are central to the faculty's role in the university's mission. By engaging faculty in this collaborative process and effort, we can create a set of guidelines that not only address the provost's concerns, but also empowers our instructors to leverage AI responsibly and ethically in their classrooms. We also had a really neat thing that happened that was unexpected, and that was the academic director of academic support, who, who's also in charge of our first year experience in courses. And we had a, a very fun, interesting conversation with our first year students before they actually matriculated this semester about AI ethics and academic integrity. And we'll be talking about that later on in the presentation. Building upon our discussion on how our institutions view AI, it's crucial that we now delve into the ethical considerations surrounding its implementation. As we've seen, the responsible use of AI requires a thoughtful approach that prioritizes the well being of all stakeholders, especially in the context of education. Now, pull out your phones one more time. Um, we're going to use a couple more times. Uh, what is your top concern, uh, uh, top AI concerns? Make sure this is activated before I tell you all to do that. And so, on polls. All right. So, we're going to go back here. Apologize for the. You pull out, use a QR code on the top right. That would be great. Otherwise, you can join by the web through that link. Make sure I get to the thing. So 33% of their main concern is, let's make sure I actually put it, put this up there. Oh, no, it still wants me to do that. So I'll go back here. So bias in AI, AI algorithms, privacy and data, data and security, which is always definitely a concern for me. Um, intellectual property concerns, that's really where we've come from. A lot of our students have that intellectual property concern. They really don't want to put their, some of our students really don't want to put their stuff into AI. And the impact of academic integrity is the lowest. It's interesting. Thank you for responding. Go back to the presentation. So for us, we really, we worked with faculty a lot. We have this, we worked with, um, we gave our faculty an article that was written in 1999 by Florida and Cowles, a unified framework of five principles of AI in society. And we we talked about in different contexts, one either one-on-one -on -one or in group discussions or in a, a workshop, the respect for aut autonomy, justice, beneficence, non-malfeance. And what was neat about their article is that they they added explicability. And I think that really is one of the most important principles and ethical, ethical principles for AI in education. But for our faculty, what really was important is the beneficence. We really wanted to work on something where AI systems must be designed to, to benefit our users, which are our students, particularly enhancing the educational experience. They should contribute positively to student and faculty outcomes and enriching learning and research while avoiding harm. And so we firmly we developed a assignments for our English 175 course, which we'll be talking about later, to actually work with our students so that they are ready for the workforce, and so that they're ready when they get a job and they can say that in an interview, yeah, I know how to use AI, and and then they can also make an informed decision of whether they want to use it or not for what they are working in. I love this quote from Dr. Fifi Lee. 
The truth, tart truth was that fields like healthcare had norms, precedents, and ethical foundation that was built over the course of centuries, if not millennia, informed by the inescapable reality of life and death. AI, by Karen Harrison, is, is so young, or was so young, that its own code of ethics was all but non-existent. And I think that's important when you think about when we're creating policies for AI at our own institutions, that AI really is brand new in terms of developing policies and stuff. And we ha it has not been around for hundreds of years. It's been around since 1950 and stuff, and that's great, but it hasn't been used by the greater population for all that long. And so when we're thinking about policies and how people react to them, their fears, and how we develop and create educational experiences for our students and upskilling for our faculty and library staff, it just hasn't been around that long. So it's going to take some time for people to integrate it into their lives. And also very, very Harding wrote a wonderful book, AI Needs You, and I suggest anyone looking into AI read it. And so AI development needs diverse voices and perspectives to be ethical and, and inclusive. Um, greed is winning when you, you, one of the richest men, Bezos, and most powerful men in the, in the world wants to help his workers by monitoring their muscles rather than asserting their humanity. It's clear that something needs to change. And it'll be, it's important to have those diverse voices. I think librarians are in an awesome position to be some of those diverse voices as we develop educational opportunities for our students, policies for our faculty, and we begin upskilling our workforce. It's clear that responsible AI usage is crucial. As information professionals, librarians have a unique opportunity to guide users in navigating the complexities of AI. Librarians can help educate the public on identifying AI-generated content, understanding algorithmic biases, and evaluating the credibility of AI-powered information sources. By empowering users with these critical skills, we can mitigate the risks of AI misuse and ensure that its powerful technology is leveraged responsibly. Looking ahead, as a presentation suggests, those who can collaborate effectively with AI will have a significant advantage. Librarians can lead the way in modeling and pr productive human partnerships. So bring out our phones again. I'm going to put this up. If you use your QR code, copy and paste, I saw some people already went to the poll, but we're going to look at the next poll. How do you use AI? And people already responded to a lot of that. If you can continue, if you haven't, that's great. So very few people use it for academic, writing academic papers. Um, a lot of people are using it for generating emails, which is where I generally recommend people when they're first starting to use AI is the, the, kind of the entry point is writing emails. Um, some people are using it for literature reviews, which is awesome. I do the same thing. I think it's a re really great way. We use ScholarC here at college as one way of writing um, literature reviews. Um, some people see data analysis and visualization, and 27% say they don't use any AI tools. So thank you for coming to this presentation and yesterday too, and hearing Dr. Leo Lowe and Michael Paulus um, talk about these things. I think it's a great way to learn more about AI. All right, moving on to the next one. I love this quote from Bill Joy. That, um, he worked at Microsoft, uh, Sun's, uh, Sun microcomputers back, and so this quote's from back in 2001, I believe, and the threat posed by artificial intelligence has less with to do with destructive power than with the heightened capacity for individual mischief. And this is something I think is very important. I think that it's the human who has, who has the, the person has more of a capacity to break academic integrity rules, to do something crazy with it. It's a human who, it's a tool, it's a collaborative tool that AI is. And I think that is important to keep into consideration. And those who can collaborate and think with AI will gradually replace those who can. And that's what, for our college, at least, at Goldie Beacon College, we want to make sure that our students are prepared in, for the workforce and we want to make sure that they will succeed in their life and be ready for anything that comes to them. And I, I shared this with Roger Strong, and it was quoted in um, 
in the Charleston Hub recently, and academic librarians are uniquely positioned to lead the ethical integration of AI into academia, ensuring it serves the community justly and effectively. I wrote a paper not too long ago, probably it feels like a long time ago now, but um, I think 2023, but it, it was in the works for a long time. And academic librarians really have the wonderful interdisciplinary skill set to work with faculty members in ways we talked about earlier of collaborating with faculty, with, especially with our policies. So we have information ethics expertise, we have bias and fairness. We can work with help with bias and fairness in AI. We have expertise in privacy and data management. We have plenty of experience with educational leadership and interdisciplinary collaboration is is kind of one of our one of our I don't know. I, I think it's just one of our greatest strengths as librarians. I saw this quote recently from Mark Walk, or saw this tweet recently by Mark Watkins, and he said, if we don't teach our students AI literacy, we risk mega corporations providing them narratives that market these tools as magic. AI is in our world, in our world, and engaging in the discourse doesn't equal adopting AI. So I think that's important when we adopt informa information literacy or AI literacy, or however we want to call it, literacy with our students to make sure that they are using these tools is that it isn't magic, it is a tool, and we need to use it collaboratively as a human and as a tool. And librarians are in a position to play a vital role in teaching information literacy, which keeps them at the forefront of the conversation AI technologies as AI technologies advance. In the previous section, we discussed the responsible use of AI tools, such as how to leverage them for research and ideation, now let's explore the importance of topic, important topic of academic integrity. Now it relates to the use of AI in your coursework. Academic integrity is a fundamental principle that upholds the credibility of our educational experience. It requires that all work you submit is generally your own without any unauthorized assistance or plagiarism. While AI tools can be useful for various tasks, using them to generate substantial positions for your arguments would be considered a violation of academic integrity. This can include, for example, using AI to write a significant portion of a research paper or essay. All right, one more poll. So is using AI to write papers a violation? We asked this to our students. I'm interested in hearing what you all have to say. All right, so 60% say yes, 43% say no. I think we still have some surveys coming in. So we'll wait, hold on for a second and see what that, that number changes. I'd like to see compared to show you what our students said. Kind of holding the same. interesting. All right, so we'll move on to our presentation is the presentation. So we asked the students this in our, in our for, as I mentioned before, we had a first year in first year experience course. And in this course, we were asked, the librarians were asked to come in and talk about academic integrity and AI. And our students responded to using AI in coursework. 33% said that it Using AI in, in coursework was a violation, not, use, not using, 65 said it was not using AI in coursework was a violation. So that's kind of a, a bit of a contrast. In submitting a draft to ChatGPT for improvement, 80% 80, 80 said it's not a violation, and 20% it is a violation. And then I thought this was also interesting. So. We talked about academic integrity a lot. So submitting 88% submitting a paper found on the web is, is a violation of the academic honor code. 93% said looking at the neighbor's test during exam is one. So we always wonder, we had a nice conversation where we the other 7% said, um, think about that. Um, using AI to write a paper, 84% said it was a, mm, in violation, but using AI to create an outline for a paper, said they said it is not. 
or so like they said that is a violation. So we actually had a higher percentage, 76% said 64 66% said that it was not a violation, and 20% of submit said submitting a draft to chat GPT for improvement. So it's interesting. So what our students have to say, the people who are, are teaching this too. In the next section, we're going to be talking about embedding AI into the English 170, our English 175 courses. And so we had three different assignments. We worked with the head department chair of English. We worked with the director of academic support to create these narrative essays where we worked on students will bring a draft of their essay. And we worked, had fun time with Grammarly writing detailed prompts, reflecting on the AI feedback and developing a revision strategy. We had a strong response paper where we used scholarly where they compared and contrast AI, their AI, um, their AI summary to their own personal AI summary of a book chapter for a common reading program. And our favorite one is using the visual expression project. It's where a large number of students chose to use AI for a project. And this session will help, help them use AI to realize their concept for visual expression. And so we, we talked a lot about prompts. We use Leo Lowe's framework for this. And so we use Grammarly for the first one for the strong, strong response paper. We're revising a narrative, or for the, sorry, excuse me, for the revising and narrative essay using Grammarly. And we taught Leo Lowe's clear framework, which is awesome. The students really engaged with that and they thought that was very intuitive. We taught them about prompt engineering and we talked about the generative AI feature in Grammarly that was not too long ago introduced. It was really fun to work with the students with this. And so we had very specific prompts that we worked on. We made sure that they were clear, that they were logical, explicit, adaptive, and reflective. And a couple of the students in one of the sessions were, wanted to put in the prompts. So they I make my, revise my paper to make it juicy. And then they, we had really great discussions after we used the word juicy and how really that lost the meaning of their, of their paper because it was a paper about their personal reflections on a topic. And so we had this wonderful um, experience sharing, hearing what the students had to say and how it worked. And we really got to the point where students felt that this is really a human and tool collaboration and AI is a tool to be used, but it doesn't have to be used for everything. In the future, we're planning on using Grammarly to start teaching students how to create keywords, because I think that's one of the things we really struggle with when in our kind of traditional one-shot information literacy instruction classes. So we've actually used it in a class not a couple of days ago, actually. We use Grammarly to use to develop keywords based off of their research questions. And it's been really helpful to help narrow down students' topics who generally, for at least our students who are first-generation students, their topics are always way too broad. So this the second assignment that we had was a strong response paper with Scholar-C. I think that we've had mixed reviews about Scholar-C in general. They, some people think it's really great. Some people don't. Some people really understand the difference between machine gener machine learning and generative AI. But this one I thought was really impactful, in when our, especially for some of the students who did respond to their in some of the questions that we did ask them. And what's neat about Scholar-C is that they now have machine learning and a generative AI tool built in, where it's called Dig Deeper. And you can ask it to summarize it. So one of the things that we did for one of the classes was we we asked it was a managing paper and a paper about management. And we asked if this paper is about managing up or is it not in the in, in the dig deeper. It said this paper is about blue ocean strategy. So it's a really wonderful way to evaluate information easily. Um, especially in students for our, at least at our school, we have two eight week sessions. And so it's not, not always enough time for them to spend in, in to evaluate information. And it's also easier for them to begin to learn how to evaluate information. And we have discussions with that and, and it generally is very impactful for our students. 
And lastly, I think this is really cool. For this assignment, for a visual expression, students had a choice between creating a poster manually with art supplies or creating a poster with AI. And this, and this is an image from last year, and it won, it was in a contest. All the posters were displayed in the library. There's probably 30% used AI and the other 70% used a manual thing. And this is the only one that won an award that, and this is an AI generated image. And this year, one of the things that we learned, we learned from last year for equity purposes, last year, anyone could choose any AI, AI image generator that they wanted. This year we're teach, we taught them to use one tool Image FX by Google, and we played around with it until all the tokens were used up. So it was a free one. We looked at a couple of other other tools that we wanted to use, but they have not used an institutional license yet. So that was kind of challenging. And so this is an example of last year's vision. Uh, so this this so we had a really great time this year with this, and we worked with creating images in Picasso and. and all sorts of different things, but everything had to come back to our common reading bro program book, War for Kindness. And so the prompt was create an image on empathy. And it was a really wonderful way to teach bias and how what we saw in these images didn't always represent real life. So there's also some anxiety over artificial intelligence and we're gonna talk about it in a second. So one student shared, and I actually ended up hiring the student to work as a student worker. And she said, AI's use in creative and academic work sacrifices the authenticity that defines a writer's voice and skill. Students should focus on learning to revise and edit their own work, which are essential skills for literacy and cognition. She does know that she's being quoted, but she has to be anonymous. Um, and it's just, it's interesting. And we had, these are the conversations that we, that came out of having assignments throughout the semester on AI tools and introducing students to lots of different AI tools so they'd be ready for the workforce. And this is important doing this AI information literacy or AI literacy or however you want to call it. The value, it teaches them this value of self-correction. Vision cannot be overstated for writers of all backgrounds. Over-reliance on AI tools can lead to a decline in essential cognitive skills, such as critical thinking and effective communication. And we really talk about in our classes, at least, the integration of your voice in the paper, paper so that we don't have problems with academic integrity and that it's you who needs to be, and your voice needs to be there. And finally, it's, there's the value of, ir is the irreplaceable value of human error revision and learning. These tools can help, help. We've had AI for a long time. We use it in Google, we use it in Amazon. Microsoft's had it in their paperclip forever. So the, these, this, these are just new tools that are coming to the market that we can teach our students how to use responsibly, ethically, and hopefully feel more confident when they are going into the workforce and for their classes to use, do, do, do well. Finally, you questions, love to answer.